experience of the void. Hey, I'm Christina. And I'm Josh. Welcome to The Void 333, a show where we dive deep into the magic of heavy music and unpopular culture. Now, there's been a special anniversary. Yes, uh, today, 21st of July, uh, 33 years of the release of one of the most famous rock albums of all time, Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses. Um, do you want to go into it? Yeah. <laughs> He's going to get into it, guys. I am. This is it. my actual copy uh, that I got. It was actually June. I got a pre-release because I live next door to a, a, a music critic. So at school, everyone was still listening to Kind of Magic by Queen. I pulled out this little baby, dumped it down to uh, my Walkman and um, was the only kid in school that was listening to this. And I've got to say, um, the album is as legendary today as it was then. Uh Everyone has their own opinion on where they were and what they were listening to and how um, Appetite changed their lives. But after uh, 30 million copies sold around the world, uh, over 18 times platinum, um, the I think it's it's a good day to celebrate uh, the 33 years of Appetite for Destruction. I think it might actually be my favourite rock record, I think. I think like... From end to end, it kind of defines all killer, no filler. Like there isn't a weak song on the whole record. You could listen to it in all different modes as well. You can be falling in love. You can be falling out of love. You can not even give a fuck. You can be like in a new town. You can just be feeling awesome. Like you can feel like feeling shit. It's got sex noises. It you know, it has that moment in it when, um, you know, that's a whole, well, you know, that's that's a whole, a whole other yeah, story. Yeah. Let's talk about folklore actually. Yeah. It has that whole. No, well, you can go away from it for two, three years, five years, whatever, and you have in your head, oh yeah, it's a great album, you know, whatever. And you put it on again, and you're just like, fuck, that is that's incredible. It's just one of those one of those albums. Um, uh, highest selling debut album of all time, um, and it's up there with um, one of the most sold albums of all time, one of the most successful yeah. um, albums of all time. I mean, it came out of the hair metal world of Sunset Strip of LA, of the 80s. Um, unfortunately, people that don't know, I think, still put it in a hair metal world, where if you know anything about um, rock and metal at the time, um, I mean, it, I, don't, I don't think it's ever should ever be class, classified strictly as a metal album. It's, it's not. But, um, you know, they, they came out of... Um, sort of the Johnny Thunders world and, and, and the punk scene that um, Duff was part of in yeah. Seattle. Um, and I think the most important part of this album, and I think why it resonates with everyone from high school kids to, you know, 46-year-old rockers to whoever, um, <laughs> I think it's it's because, like, for me, it was the first time I'd ever heard, and this isn't, but it's the first time I'd ever heard swearing on an album. And I remember being 14 and it literally blew my fucking head off. Um, but you know, I mean, they were dubbed the most dangerous band in the world, which I hate. I think it's a ridiculous yeah. title. But um, if you read into the, 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 the background of the band and, and, and they really were living it, living yeah. the, I mean, from, what was it, 80, 85, I think. It was some time before they got their album out, yeah. a long time. But, um, you know, they did their hell tour up the Pacific West Coast. Um, up to Seattle uh, in, I think it was 86. Um, yeah. And then it all came together and they all lived, they're all living together in like a. They were disgusting. Yeah, yeah, they were in a storage facility out the back of Sunset Strip. Um, and there are so many little areas along Sunset, it's by the, near the guitar factory, I believe, um, that are part of the. The folklore. The folklore yeah. of Guns N' Roses. But in short, it was a band that was living. What they were singing about, yeah. which is not always, you know, it's all. <laughs> it, I'll leave it to, I'll leave it to the, yeah, you know. Yeah. But, they, but they were, and I mean, the it was poetic, and I think, you know, sometimes I remember someone saying that sometimes when you bring people outside of things into things, they can make it greater than what it was before. And I don't know why this just popped into my head, but you like take like Axel coming from like Indiana mm. and was Izzy from out of town yeah, as no, well? Izzy, Izzy was Izzy from the Axel same place. Yeah. So and you've got know. like these kind of two Midwestern kind of kids. Slash is very much the, the LA kid. Um, yeah. 
growing up in the thing. Yeah. His mother was like a costume designer, wasn't she, yeah, for like yeah, Bowie? She, and she yeah. dated Bowie. Yeah. So uh, he was like the real LA rock and roll. They're like Midwest and, you know, Duff is like the Seattle, like punk rock kid who played his first ever show as a 13 year old playing in a band called The Veins, opening up for Black Flag. I mean, those are some chops right there. Uh, like, that's like a really interesting thing. And Adler, where did Adler Adler, 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 and, Adler and Slash were best mates oh from when they were like 13, I think. And they used to run amok together around West Hollywood and, and, and Hollywood in general. Um, yeah, that's a good rock and roll. Like, that's a really good rock and roll kind of pedigree. Yeah, yeah. and apparently Adler was great with sports and it's all about picking up girls. And he, I think... <laughs> Drumming came later from memory. I yeah. think when Slash started playing more, um, it was kind of like, oh, well, he's playing guitar. I might as well start, dr you know, drumming. So I think Adler sort of was, was behind Slash. And, and then, but that's the thing. It's one of those rare moments in the creative culture where all the, like, as you said, all those elements come together and create a near perfect yeah. uh, piece of art. And the color, yeah, they're just, they were just like, they were cutting characters. Like, they really were. They were all these amazing caricatures. I always, like, whenever I get, like, too, like, ah, I'm, like, an excited, I'm not cool. Like, I'm psyched about most things. I'm always, like, fuck, I just need to be more like Izzy. Izzy Stradlin, the rhythm guitarist, is the definition of yeah. cool. He's, like, I have so much confidence. I'm playing on this record with Slash, and I'm just fine. And I'm, like, killing it and bringing it. And, yeah. He was yeah. the key. They... they do credit him as like a key motivator in, in, in the writing of a lot of those songs. Yeah. Um, and the byplay between Slash, Slash's lead and, and Izzy's um, rhythm, you know, th there's a handful of great rhythm duos in the in the history of rock which is fit in and that is definitely one of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I think also the songs themselves still stand up today. Um, they released a box set of the uh for the 30th and it was near the 30th yeah. anniversary 2018 i think it was they released the locked and loaded box yeah. set and on that they had a whole lot of demos it was like yeah. uh, and a lot of the times you just going yeah right over but they did there was a sound city sessions yeah. in 1986 and it was f awesome to get because you were listening to the album from a totally stripped back just straight up playing it yeah. um in the sun city studios and um, Sound City Studios, honestly. Um, <laughs> Sound City Studios. And, I, you know, the songs, even without the production, which I think Mike Klink uh, yeah. produced the album and, and really, again, another beautiful piece of, of the puzzle that just yeah. brought it all together. Um, and I, I, I would argue that I think the songs stand up. You listen to that Sound City, the Sound City demos or session, yeah. whatever whatever it ends up being. but um, And the, the songs do stand up. Oh, you know, even without the production. Well, and the production doesn't feel like the production. Like, if you look at, like, these great seismic shifts, like, if you look at, like, the Black Album for Metallica or whatever, the production has a capital P. It's a big shift. It's a huge, you know, that is that is an entire other conversation that we're not going to get into here. You look at, like, like I often think about, like, the first Rage Against the Machine album. Like, Andy Wallace is fucking one of the greatest mixes of all time, great producer. But I'm not going to lie, sometimes I think about, like, what would have happened if a really earthy, gritty, like hardcore producer, like a Kurt Bailu had produced the first Rage album, probably wouldn't have gotten on the radio, probably wouldn't have been as huge, wouldn't, you know, yeah. but I don't know, like I, but I feel like the thing about what's special about Appetite is you don't even think about the production. It's so, I just feel like that the instruments, so it's so organic. invisible. Like, and, and apparently Slash would just come in and would just play and that was it. Like, um, and a hot tip for everyone. I mean, Duff McKagan's autobiography and Slash's autobiography. I haven't read Steve Adler's, but yeah. I heard it's, it's good. They're definite, definite must reads. If, it's, yeah, if it's mainly he got every opportunity and fucked it up and got really wasted and then fucked some more goals. Well, There's nothing wrong with that. That's a rock and roll life. And I think Duff. I mean, Duff's and Slash's are on the other side. I think you know Slash, Slash and Duff both continued on and, and we all know that they got back together in 2016 2015 yeah. 2016 but i it's it's they're great autobiographies but um slash was talking about he quite often wasn't in the state to play and i think he 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 had that one gibson then he'd come down and he'd just play one or two takes and that was it and walk away um and tommy's a two touts the A and R manager for yeah. Geffen at the time, he who who had signed Motley Crue and had signed Metallica, yeah. um, 
he was instrumental in getting the, a producer in because they they did meet with Paul Stanley from Kiss. Um, and I have a kiss. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to expand the sound and wanted to go rack toms and everything. Uh, whereas there's a famous story uh, about there's a famous story about them the walking in out. and kept pulling back. Steve, I think Slash and wasn't no, it was Izzy would keep pulling back Steve's drum kit to make it as simple as possible. Yeah. Maybe it was Axel and Izzy, but um, any any but, any any attempt for Steve to go bigger on the drum kit was was undermined by the members of the band who would actually pull parts away and not even yeah. tell Steve about it um, to keep it simple. But then you listen to that album, and that is why um, that album is so fucking good. Adler's drumming, he really was just the key to the sound of that that yeah. brought it all together and you know there, there are mistakes and uh, not on mistakes but there are little imperfections through that album that is actually what gives yeah. it the humanity if you did it now like with pro tools and everything and you line it up it it wouldn't be the same album but an interesting point too is apparently uh axel with the the 2008 lineup of guns and roses as we know was a mixture of the bucket heads and yeah. um God, I, I, was, I saw a list of everyone that played with guns. I guns. saw that tour, yeah. It's, well, I didn't, but. Yeah. Well, that band was always about alchemy, you know. You can't, you but, can't. Yeah. The irony is that Axel's Guns N' Roses was the exact antithesis of why the original Guns N' Roses lineup worked. Because, Expand on that. Well, everyone, <laughs> everyone, everyone, they lived together, ate together. They used to go to yeah. Com Compadre's uh, Mexican restaurant on Sunset. Um, Mark Cantor, who was Slash's best mate, um, owned Deli. Yep, Cantor's Deli, which I went to when I was in LA last time. Um, a lot of the early photos of, of uh, GNR was were taken by Mark Cantor, who would just really? who would just follow them around, and take photos. Yeah. Now, I remember sitting at the counter and looking at a booth, and I was like, I fucking know that booth. Anyway, um, all of GNR used to go down to Cantor's Deli, and Mark would feed them because yeah. um, you know it's legendary the stories of them. <laughs> They get blowjobs under the table. Yeah. And also, you know, they, like the strippers, they would go down, the strippers would, they would, they would some, crash at the strippers' houses. Yeah. They would, the strippers would feed them. I mean, this is an album that just came through the pores of every band member for, for better or for worse. Yeah. Um, you know, they lived together, in, like I think I mentioned before, in a little storage facility um, across the road from Guitar World. And they would party there every night, but they would rehearse twice a day. Um, and the songs just came together. Welcome to the Jungle came together in three hours. You yeah. know, like, and that pleases me. And and what I was saying about the antithesis of yeah. what was to become Guns N' Roses later with with uh, the new lineup, um, you know, it was made up of all amazing musicians. Um, a whole bat. If you if you know if you Google it, you get yeah. a whole list of these amazing musicians that have done time with Guns N' Roses. Oh, I saw a guy who was on the Nine Inch Nails live band. What's his name? Um, was it Buck? No. Robert uh, Fink. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was like a huge part. He was like in the Guns and in the Nine Inch Nails band a really good time from memory. Um, yeah, I couldn't. Awesome. Yeah, like he's, he's like been amazing. With, yeah. He's been with Nine Inch Nails. For, I've seen Nine Inch Nails about six, seven times, and he's been with them every time. I think he does all, all of the the live I stuff. Love Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. But interestingly, as well, um, yeah, Matt. Oh, Ma yeah, you go. I was just gonna say to finish that point, um, Axel re-recorded. Um, appetite for destruction. That makes new, new lineup. So now, thankfully, know. thankfully, thankfully, that's never been released. And he's hoping it never actually does get released because there is no way. You can I feel about that the way I feel about the Point Break remake, which is yeah. I don't feel good about it. I don't. I don't feel good. I don't think that Point Break remake should have come out. But I just, yeah, we're not going to go there. We I don't need. To, we don't need to mess it because. Th and this really was a moment. And I'm going to briefly um cut away to Duff talking about why this album was what it was it was a you know, that record i i mean um uh, we've all had time away from it yeah, but of course. being in the band is and being part of writing those songs it's is extra hard to, to get have, away from yeah it. to have any kind of perspective on it yeah and i i'm sure i don't still yeah. <laughs> um but i i i do understand like those songs we worked so hard on it and we were at that point uh in a maturity yeah which was not quite mature, but we were learning how to write songs. Yep. And that chemistry of that band and working really hard on all the little parts of those songs um, 
we would rehearse twice a day and it, we just lived for it. Yeah. And when you're 20, you don't have, uh, you, all you care about is your band. All yeah. you care about is that and the next song. Next show and the next, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, um, you grew up in the Seattle punk scene, right? We were all veterans of bands. So, yeah. and really, you know, when you're not 20 years old and you've been playing in bands for touring even for six years, <laughs> you're a veteran. <laughs> you were playing in bands at 14. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they were living it, and they were yeah. um, just in it. And that, what's interesting, I don't know, I think one of the big things, <laughs> and it's not even just music, mm. the things that were kind of a part of the 80s and 90s, if you were born in the 80s and 90s as far as culture, is there was an element of hope to it that I don't think exists <laughs> on the same level. Like, you could become a big rock star, you could become the biggest thing in the world I don't really feel like it's the same now and I think I have this theory right that new metal came along and basically the old school of the rock and roll like establishment like the David Geffens of the world who grew up on like Laurel Canyon Canyon kind of you know Stills Crosby and Nash kind of it was so alienating to them that they were like I can't deal with rock and roll anymore I could be New wrong. Metal. This is very much based on an extremely outsider's uneducated, unresearched opinion. But I have this weird feeling that that moment kind of shifted that. But I think maybe we should stay in Guns N' Roses land for a bit longer yeah, before we do that. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, like visually, culturally, it, you know, I think Think About You is one of the greatest and most underrated love songs of all time. Like, I think that is like, it's just... I just, well, you know, like they've got all these big ass songs and yeah. Well, the other interesting thing is too, I mean, it came out 21st of, 20th, 20, 21st of July, um, 87 and it didn't hit the top of the charts until June, July, no, August 6th, um, 80, 88. So it took nearly, it took over a year to, um, hit the top of the charts. When Sweet Child of Mine came out, which in this little moment, Duff talks to Jerry Cantrell about. Guns, we, we did break in, in like two weeks. I, I saw it going down, but we had been a band for like working our ass off 24-7, yep. living together without a toilet for three and a half years. Yep. So we didn't break overnight and we toured and toured and toured and toured and nobody bought our record, you know, for the first year and then we released uh, uh, no, that record nobody bought until Sweet Child came out. And then right. suddenly we were playing, there were seven people, you know, and the next night there were 17, which was like a big, and the next night there were 70, and then, you know, next time we were yeah. 700, and then... And your song is Man in the Box. Yeah, the same thing. We put our record out, we toured for, God, six months, yeah. and we sold maybe, maybe 40,000 records. Maybe. Wow. And then it's not like 40,000 records now. Yeah, 40,000 records then, then yeah, is like... Yeah. Uh, you know, that's we were we were on tour with we were on a fallen on metal tour. We were opening up with Slayer, Megadeth, and Anthrax on the Clash of the Titans. Nobody knew who the hell we were, especially not Slayer fans and Megadeth fans. Yeah, Boxer really shorts didn't probably go very yeah, well. Probably didn't. Yeah, combat yeah. Louis Taylor yeah. from Slipknot saw that show and he yeah. said it was an absolute spiritual experience yeah. seeing you guys because yeah. you were like this new kind of sound that no one knew about and that was kind of the moment that music broke in the sort of heavy metal world. That's when Man on the Box yeah. hit, like you yeah. said, with Sweet Child of Mine. When that song hits, you see everything turn on its head. Yeah. It was pretty cool to, to live through that, seeing that, you know, and uh, have that be part of your part of your history yeah. and have that sort of a, that sort of a moment, you know, yeah. you never forget that. It would have been pretty cool to be a part of watching that, like watching that Sweet Child of Mine moment where everything happens and I think, yeah, that song craft really matters. And well, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, obviously the sweet child that the Duff has talked about, um, and Tommy Zatau. Oh fuck! Zatau, I think. Zutau? Sorry, Tommy. Yeah. Sorry, if you Tommy, ever yeah. see this, we're um, acknowledging your importance in the story. Tommy yeah. tells a great story about um, the heads of Geffen basically saying that um, that Guns N' Roses were never going to be on MTV. Um, cause I think one of the co-owners or one of the co-runners actually just as he was a good Republican man decided that Guns N' Roses were not right Yeah, they were TV. And, um, anyway, Tommy pleaded with the head of Geffen at the time, um, and was given one spot on MTV, uh, four o'clock in New York and one o'clock in LA. And they're only going to play the song once. Um, 
and apparently when he went into work the next morning it was a huge commotion and apparently 10,000 people had rung in to MTV when they'd seen it yeah. um, and lost their minds and and then that basically uh, his first meetings with Geffen Promotions and that they were like okay mm -hmm. they turned it around because you know it only sold 200,000 in the first first yeah. sort of few months of being released which is I mean that's a lot but it's not yeah. in terms of where not Geffen we're aiming for yeah, no yeah. So, um, you know, it, it got a second life. The um, slow burn. Well, the slow yeah. burn is real. The yeah. slow burn is real for everything. And the whole concept of things catching fire straight away is... But just think yeah. about, just think about, there must be hundreds of albums yeah. that had the slow burn. So, I mean, a lot of which we listen to if you're a music sort of fanatic and you find, you know, you sort them out. But yeah. the albums that didn't go commercial. Um, but there must be hundreds and thousands of albums that just didn't get yeah that we never heard yeah. we never heard it's like when people say oh they're like we were just watching a bunch of old guns interviews and tommy so he's like the great band is out there i'm like yeah there's like so many of them but it's so hard now to get above the din and it's like it looks really democratic like the world of the internet and the new digital platforms but it's not like people oh. buy space, people, it's it's arguable, like there is definitely invisible fucking forces throwing money and creating funnels and whatever. Yeah, but I also think, I also think, and this will harken back to why we're talking about appetite for destruction, is that despite the technologies, despite the, the emergence of digital, the internet, social networking, streaming um, platforms, the thing about good music bands, um, songs. Well, yeah, but I, I, I don't even think it's that. I, I think it is just a perfect moment in time where everything falls into place, right? Yeah. Be it management, be it producer, be it the guitar that the guitarist picks up that day and plays, yeah. or the solo he plays, the ad in the music or box. yeah, or a bunch of school friends coming together. Um, I think that that's, and there are so many bands that have nine out of those 10 elements yeah, but point. just mu just misses that one and the internet now with you know i think it opens up it gets you out to more and more kids and, and yeah. your accessibility to listening to bands i mean i know that since i got spotify in 2011 my access to bands and new music and particularly you know was listening to exodus the other day and then i just was like oh yeah i've heard of this creator song and i can just dial up creator's catalog and listen yeah. to it which i couldn't do before 2011 or or, yeah. or even 2000 with itunes but i think now it, it gets you out there but it doesn't necessarily sell or, or move yeah the, the revenue stream element is missing like well, people are the zeitgeist, zeitgeist, there is a problem. Right? yeah and there is like a survival thing where the the new survival thing has not quite established itself and back then you didn't have to be the record company guy and you didn't have to be all this stuff so it's like we have the freedom now yeah. and it's yeah. a, it's an interesting thing because like there are like flips to it like i was talking to someone who was probably 20 and i'm in my 30s and we're talking about it, and he's like oh like everything's fucked and now it used to be awesome it's like the industry's always been exploitative and fucked and to be honest your weird gore grind noise album you wouldn't have even been able to make yeah yeah. I mean, um, every decade, you know, I think yeah. every decade from the fifties um, has had its, you know, to be positive, has yeah. had its good side and then had its exploitative bad side. Yeah. It's just like in the fifties, sixties, um, you go into it. It was the promoters that were taking the piss of the bands and yeah, and like the, the endless upper manager, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, like fighting it back. Like, yeah, it was the seventies. Yeah. You know, then you had. Um, an emergence of, of the rock the rock thing and the who coming through and and zeppelin obviously and and then the 80s obviously you know depending like you can pick any market in the world each market yeah. um even those that aren't popularized like sunset strip hair metal bands and stuff there was good and bad yeah. and i think now you know the your accessibility to recording and being able to record in the bedroom and get that up online and get that out is fantastic yeah. but what you don't have now is the record company dollars behind you yeah. pushing you forward yeah. which as you know it's the same with feature films and uh, a studio will fund you know say they fund 10 films only one of those f films will actually make the money yeah. uh, yeah. and cover all the others so even if you did have the backing of the record company um it wasn't a guarantee of success but you had a better shot of getting there yeah. 
because uh, you had the money behind you. But then these guys ended up owing lots of money. I, I know the Divine Wolves. Oh, man. Sit- Australia and debt. Australia and like the... The, the giant right. loan that record companies and gave this artists. Is probably not a yeah. bad segue yeah. into introducing Tony because yeah. the Divinals were a big part of his career. Yeah. But the Divinals um, were ha- considered to be the that were going to be the the big the big band of, of yeah. the 80s um, and into the 90s. Let's set them up for people like who've never heard of the Divinals. They were a Sydney band. They were headed by the. She was the Iggy Pop, the explosion, you know, and um, our first interview guest, which we're about to introduce shortly, can elaborate on this a bit more. But yeah, do you want to set set up um, uh, who the Divinals were in, in the context of yeah, Sydney? I mean, yeah. you know, coming out of the world of Australian pub rock, um, I think we've touched on this before, but Australia and particularly Sydney at the time had an incredibly vibrant music scene. Most bands were playing up and down from the Northern Beaches, for those that don't know Sydney, um, Northern Beaches through to the city and then down to the South Coast. Um, You could play six nights a week uh, in any number of bars or pubs um, because back then, you know, you didn't have a chat room or a a social or a Facebook group that you could go and you would literally go down to the nearest pub if your band was playing or, or bands that you liked. So you found your people by going to these gigs. Yeah. And um, so on a Monday night, a lot of these bands got their start on Monday night. The Vinyls got their start at Monday night. Um, oh, and Tony will tell you the name of the hotel, <laughs> which I've completely forgotten. Yeah. But these bands came out of an incredibly vibrant music scene. And yeah. the Vinyls were um, obviously one of those in 1983. Um, and the fronted by Chrissy Am- Amphlett, who yeah. really is yeah. arguably... Yeah. Yeah. Arguably the greatest female front woman of yeah, all time, one and of the great front fr- best front people of all time as well. Yeah. Like not even gender specific. Like she could fucking destroy any room. She was not a band you wanted to follow. Like just right. and the level of unpredictability. And I think this is what truly defines like great front personship. Great singers are scary. Scary. And you don't know what the shit is about to happen. And I will cut away briefly to Duff again because it's, I have a great moment about Axel. I got to say, like, Axel, I came from the punk rock scene, yeah. and Axel was more punk than the most punk guy I knew because it was real. Like, it was, it were, there was a, like a real, he was dangerous. Like, something could happen anytime he didn't give a fuck. <laughs> Just, yeah, I'm going to be, yeah. Or he's more metal than the metal guy. He was more Freddie Mercury than, you know, like, he was. So, and that band was punk rock. No, we didn't give a shit. And even when it got huge and, some, you know, some people say bloated and all that stuff, I was bloated for a while. about two years. Like, when most of the pictures were taken, I was bloated. Um, you looked fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was still, like, we were doing things on our own terms, in our own bubble. Yeah. Um, nothing affected us. No changes in music affected us. We were still playing stadiums and... Um, you know, we didn't. The one thing we couldn't do anymore though was go play a club. Yeah. We were just too big. Coming back from that, yeah, that that unpredictability is actually something I think Axel and Chrissy really share. Anyway, the vinyls and Tony Mott. Yeah. I think um, we should. It's really special. Well, yeah, and Tony Mott. Um, we will introduce him in more detail in literally seconds, but um, he's like one of the most seismic photographers i think in it definitely in australian rock history and and in rock history he's um he just brings a certain energy to it that it's hard to really quantify like you have seen a tony mott image like you 100 percent have that's if you're into this kind of music like you have seen an image he toured um with the big day out for a bunch of years and big day out um was the biggest rock tour, I, I toured on the Soundwave Festival a few years later, which was like a punk rock metal festival and was basically like the second, the next one down. But the Big Day Out was like, the Big Day Out was like one of the most special things that ever happened to Australia. Yeah, it was cool. And he was their official photographer. Hello, I'm Christina. Welcome to The Void 333, only halfway evil with my co-host, Joshua. And our very special guest, Tony Mott, who has spent decades in an absolutely 
like explosive moment <laughs> in the history of rock and roll, capturing moments on film in stills that feel like a whole show. Like you've actually captured more time in a little bit of time. How do you feel about time? Uh, well, th that's a good description of what, what I did, but I never thought I shot the whole show because in the days of film, yeah. unlike the digital age, you only got 10% back. Mm. So when you went out, you'd shot you know, four rolls of film. Good example would be Johnny Rotten with the Pill Show at the yeah. Horden Pavilion and the Halo Show, which became quite famous. Um, yeah, it's a great show and I love it. Yeah. Mm. Um, I didn't get much else that night. <laughs> that, 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 that was about it. Yeah. And that was fine because in the days of film, as I said, it was 10% results. So you didn't, cap I mean, you did capture the show, but you didn't get, whereas di the first tour I ever did with, um, with a digital camera, Nikon gave me a di digital camera and I shot mm. Judas Priest out at the Homebish. And nice. I was doing the whole show <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm working with them for two or three nights so I can practice with this digital shit. And um, <laughs> I started shooting it. <laughs> And at the end of the show, I got a sense I was cheating because there was so right. much back. It was just easy. Right. And for the first time, I've always said in rock and roll photography, you can't do this pissed. Digital, mm. you can. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah. But I, I, now when I'm shooting, uh, I, I always keep it down to two bottles of Sauvignon Blanc max. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, keep it. 1,000 brown M&Ms. Keep it level. Brown, <laughs> keep it level. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you can't see the stage. It's yeah. all like, and that, even digital can't help you. <laughs> It's brilliant. I love it. Rock and roll photography, I used to split into two. There's a yin and a yang to it. There's mm -hmm. live photography and then mm -hmm. there's portrait. Right. Now, live photography, the musician is in their natural element. You don't have to worry about mm -hmm. them. They're happy doing that. Mm -hmm. your, your problem is you have no control over circumstances. Uh, the aforementioned Johnny Rotshot mm -hmm. was in mm -hmm. the days before mosh pits. So right. I'm in with the punks right. pogoing on my head and right. spitting in the general direction yeah. of the artist. <laughs> and so you're all over the place. Yeah. Plus, I've got no control over the lights yeah. or where Johnny's going to go and sing. Mm -hmm. But he's in his element, so you're capturing what they do mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. When you've got the portrait and you're doing it yourself, you set up, you've got plenty of time, set up the lights so the light's what you want, the yeah. whole bit. But yeah. you've taken the musician out of the na natural environment. Mm -hmm. And depending on who the artist is, because there's definitely artists who are comfortable in front of the camera, but there's a hell of a lot are not as comfortable. ACDC, yeah, yeah. uh, and that you're not going to get ACDC to pose in any way. Like yeah, they're not going to yeah, go, yeah. they're not going to sort of like do anything yeah. or do anything. They're just going to be five guys stood there, like, and you just try and get what you can get out of it. It hasn't affected their career one iota. No, it's no it's just I remember seeing, yeah. I remember seeing in, uh, when they released Black Ice, there was a, you know, you open the Sunday Mail and there's a full page of the band, and did like they've got their sneakers and they've got the big loops on their sneakers and that no one's tidied anything up it's just this is how they are this is yeah. literally oh, yeah. they've walked in and this is what they are well it's like they would refuse to do festivals because like we don't need you we don't need a festival but, uh, so oh but, do you do you know more yeah, of that story there was a long there was a long period of time where big, uh, big day out, big day out we're, we're, we're trying to get uh acdc Are and courting them and negotiators the negotiating was going on quite well apart from the bomb the the worst big day out they ever had was metallica year just mm. purely because Metallica was announced early mm. and you've sold 70,000 Metallica tickets. Mm. So it's not a festival anymore. It's a Metallica yeah. gig with support. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, so, yeah. so they obviously didn't want that with ACDC. And the idea was really? ACDC to play mid-afternoon unannounced 45-minute greatest hits. The oh. idea, and the selling point of that is for people to go a whole generation to discover what a great live band they are that don't yeah, get it. Right, and it would have right. worked. And the only reason it was going to, because obviously the management were never going to agree because the Big Dad couldn't pay the money yeah. that they... they, they yeah. But Brilliant. Malcolm Young's kids went to the Big Day Out and they were going like, Dad, why aren't you playing the Big yeah. Day Out? Yeah. And that was the selling point. It right, never happened right, and it never right. got beyond talking. Oh, but there right. was a possibility at one point that ACDC were going to do it unannounced Greatest hits, 45 minutes set in yeah. daylight in the mid-afternoon. It would have blown people's mind. And you imagine the publicity for ACDC, if they were just about mm. to do a world tour, oh, yeah. that would have been great. Five yeah. gigs around yeah. Australia, unannounced. Did we cover your, so your association with Big Day Out? You, we, I think we were talking yeah. about it off camera, but yeah. you, you were so, the official. Yeah, so if you're in another country and you're not in Australia, the Big Day Out was probably, I would say, the most beloved rock festival in Australian in the latter day Australian history. The I Toronto think so, yeah. Animal, yeah. And, and, and it was also the only travelling festival in Australia that's ever happened, as in yeah. it travelled around the country successfully at the time. Mm. Uh, well, that came late, yeah. much later. Yeah. But uh, uh, Lollapalooza was the equivalent in America. Mm. Uh, and all the bands, particularly the American bands, that had done Lollapalooza and their Big Day Out, they just said, this is a holiday in comparison. Because mm. going around mm. the Big Day Out, you did all the cities, it was over three weeks, and if yeah. you weren't doing sideshows, it was five days in 21. 
the bands were getting 17 yeah, days right. off. Yeah. They, they were like, this Which is, is great. Whereas well, in America, Lollapalooza, it's a uh, travel day show, mm. travel day show, travel day show, right. hardly any time off days. Whereas, yeah, um, I remember uh, Pono for Pyros, mm. uh, Perry Fowl just couldn't believe how many days off he was getting mm. uh, and mm. why weren't we doing sideshows? And they originally agreed not to do sideshows. Right. And they ended up having uh, a lot of time off. Yeah, right. Did they get up to mischief? Everyone gets up to mischief. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I heard some Al Jorgensen stories that were quite colourful. Yeah, yeah. Quite a, yeah, yeah. That was that, 95, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the great one with Al Jorgensen was when yeah. um, uh, the, the poor girl who used to do the riders, and she's going, what the fuck's a nap? Uh, 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 no, what's he called? Nappy? No, what, are the, what, what are the Americans call it? What are the Americans? Diaper. Yeah, right. but they've got another word it's for it. It's true. Oh. I didn't know it was it real. Is. And oh, they presumed it. They, I wrote that they, story. They, they presumed it was a cocktail. And there's like this big discussion. that Whatever the Americans call diapers, and it's not diapers. Um, I thought this was just what is she? I thought <laughs> this was just pacifier. A pacifier. They asked for a pacifier. Oh, I thought you meant a nappy because I thought no, it's a nappy. Oh, yeah. That's an American version of a. Oh of, my of god! A I thought that was folklore. And everyone was presuming that this pacifier oh, was a was a cocktail. I don't know. And the poor guy's going, going yeah. "What the fuck yeah. goes into a pacifier?" And yeah. it turns out it was uh, Al Jorgensen needed um, yeah diapers. Um, uh, and oh, he's so exciting for me right and now. He and Courtney got off to quite a bit of mischief. They were yeah. they, they hung out a bit. And Courtney got up to mischief. It was what? Yeah, scaring the shit out of what were seventeen year old silver chair at the time. <laughs> what, did, right. what did she do? And on that she shook their uh, she shook their um um their tour bus and there's just a, you, <laughs> some of these at this point they're seventeen years old yeah. and there's this monster woman got the, the whole bit and she was she referred to them as as uh, Nirvana in pajamas. Um, well, that's Sound. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, she was. Uh, well, my, my story of, of Courtney on that tour was uh, and ministry. So yeah, I'm shooting yeah. ministry, and I've met Courtney at some so point. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm on stage in New Zealand yeah. shooting ministry, and I'm on stage, side of stage. Yeah. Ministry is so loud, I've got industrial strength earplugs, yeah. and I'm shooting them with a long lens. Uh, and I'm in pitch dark, and I'm shooting, and then all of a sudden I'm aware of a presence coming next to me. <laughs> I don't know where. And then all of a sudden I see it, it's Courtney, and uh, I'm just shooting. <laughs> and eventually she said, shoot me shoot me and i'm trying to explain come on we can't communicate so oh, yeah. like and my lens is like this big and you've yeah. got to be about 20 yards away from me yeah. again i'm going yeah. wrong lens wrong lens and she starts to get pissed off but yeah, i'm not yeah. taking yeah, a photograph yeah. and she's flashed me a little bit next thing i know she starts to grapple with me and in the background <laughs> i can see her minder like her and i'm thinking <laughs> he's gonna beat the shit. <laughs> and i'm also aware and she's unaware <laughs> That there's like a 20 foot drop down here into the pit yeah. and she's grabbed it. Anyway, luckily he goes and she's literally going, yeah <laughs> and she's literally about yeah. to kill me yeah. and i was due to do a photo session with hole the very next day in a, in, in a studio <laughs> in Auckland. A portrait. and i'm thinking well that's the end of that then, isn't it yeah. lobby the next day oh motty how are you, Good <laughs> see you. Yeah. Vroom, vroom, yeah. Vroom. it was just yeah. rock and roll yeah it was just rock and roll. Rock. Oh, she's just you know, she's more punk rock than anyone it seems she was pretty punk rock. Yeah. And she, got, she got the stiletto heel to the uh, head in uh, Selena's the night, the first night in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, Someone um, threw a stiletto at her. Yeah, it caught right in the face, and that was a 15-minute show at Selena's. Yeah, that was right. fairly infamous at the time. Um, that was the first time, because they came back later. They were, she was much more in control the second time. She wasn't mm. so bad, mm. but she was. Um, she was flashing her private parts on a fairly regular basis. Yeah, I saw them yeah. in '95. Yeah, you saw yeah. her parts mm. on the parts. Mm. That was, I think, it was the ministry. It was, I think, it was Cult Rage Against the Machine ministry. They, they, they came twice. The first time they yeah. came, and I, the, yeah, the, all those stories I'm talking yeah. about are just mixed up because there's two tours. Yeah. The first one there was the Cult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Silver right. Chair was just at the height and the whole bit, and the second time was the Marilyn Manson. Right, was right, that, right. And who was the headliner? Corn uh, were on it. Corn. And there was someone else. Slipknot. Oh, that would have been their yeah. first album too. Oh, yeah. who else was it though? Yeah, there was right. someone. Uh, How did you go with them? Oh, you couldn't. You, you couldn't. Corey's great. You could, you could not not get on with Slipknot. They were yeah. great. Yeah. I, so, I, Good Midwestern My wife, Hawaii. who's not into that style of music, yeah. I yeah. said to her, "You should come to the Horden, and see yeah. Slipknot. I guarantee they will entertain you." I would never put a Slipknot record on at home, yeah. but I would guarantee you go and see it. I said, you'll never see it. At that point, they were using lots of beer barrels yeah. Yeah. and they were filling yeah. the beer barrels with different levels yeah, to get different sounds now, on the percussion. Yeah. They were great. Yeah. Um, so I did the front cover of Kerrang! of Slipknot at the yeah. Horton Pavilion, met yeah. them at the sound check, yeah. went out the back, the back uh, set up a little studio, and uh, I think it was two or three band members who we just couldn't find them. And eventually I just had the bright and I said, why can't you just put the red uniforms <laughs> on the roadies. Oh, you did it. And that front cover of Kerrang. Oh, Kerang, you did it. No, you really? Did. The, I can't remember if it's two. Oh, that's awesome. I, yeah. I don't know if it's two or three band members are missing. Yeah. And then it dawned on me, because the journalist, Jeremy Schaefer, who's a, a, a really quite a big uh, metal writer in Australia, he did yeah. the story and he goes, Kerrang, mate, we'll get murdered when they find out. No, no one noticed. 
And yes. Corey, <laughs> Corey yeah. was quite distinctive. Expo so you could see, so you could see him. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. the others you couldn't see. And it was I can't remember if it was yeah, two right. or three roadies. And then when the band members turned up where they are, they they were like really pissed off. Yeah. But the photos yeah. looked so good, I was going, yeah. oh, I've run out of film. <laughs> when they came the first time, and it's pre big day out, yeah. I think mm. they did two nights at the Horde and sold out. Mm. Yeah. No record company, mm. no press, mm. no nothing. And yet that subculture can survive. Not obviously they're not going to do stadiums, but get to that level. And there's a load of bands in that category. And it's That's like right. yeah. you turn around to people and go, I'm going <clears> over to the Horton Pavilion, Slipknot. And they'll go, who's Slipknot? And you go, mm. no, mate, the yeah. kids who are into that music. They know exactly who these guys That's are. Right. Yeah. They, they were like, and, and they mm. maintain that level the entire time. They never go, you know, to the stratosphere yeah. of mainstream, mm, 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 mm. but they always get a level where they'll always be able to but do good business. I'd like to... I'd like to go back in time back. to a special moment because you, you have been witness. I'm really glad that you go. both, um, I'm really glad that I transmitted that, that I'd like you to do that to Sam because yeah. it was really appropriate. We're right. We're yeah, really no, yeah, yeah, you really have. Right? Yeah. I think um, uh, a certain singer called Chrissy. You um, have a very close personal connection to the Divinals yeah. and The only Chrissy. reason I'm a rock and roll mm. photographer is Chrissy Ampler. So wow. I was a French chef by trade. I worked in King's Cross. Sydney and Australia in general had the greatest live music scene in the mm. world. And mm. I was qualified to say that because I'd mm. been to London Tell me and New York, LA. Tell me again. So, Is that really true? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's absolutely. Just what we absolutely. Keep saying. <laughs> on, on Friday, yeah. Saturday night, you could see 60 bands comfortably. Uh, and Surrey Hills and had 11 venues. And on the Trade Union what? Club, the Trade Union Club would have 14 live bands on a Friday night. So 28 bands over two nights. Uh, and and we're talking event, the headliners were often quite good bands. So yeah. it was a great live music scene. And yeah. we had, um, you could go and see great bands on Monday night, yeah. let alone Friday, Saturday night. And the, at the time, before the Divinals were known, they had a residency. Lots of people had residencies. So they'd play every Tuesday night for six months, yeah. Piccadilly Hotel in King's Cross. Yeah. So anyway, I, I went in, I used to go and see bands there and uh, I saw the Divinals mm. and I watched Chrissy develop into what This is 83? 82, probably. 82, 82. They'd just, just done the soundtrack to Monkey, Monkey Group, Group. The film, but it yeah. hadn't come out. Yeah. So anyway, I was watching them and I, I was a bit of a drinker and I was drinking them one night and I had a huge interest, mainly through traveling. I'd been to um, 60 countries and I used to like to do portraits. Mm. And uh, I was watching the live on stage and thinking, fuck, that's going to be difficult. All the lights going on off and she's running around like a banshee. And so I just took my camera and I think I took my camera for about three months. And luckily in that three months, no one asked to see them apart from me because they were crap. I couldn't do it. Mm. And slowly mm. but surely, I worked out how you got it, how you could actually make the, uh, you, you had to get rid of the, the light meter was irrelevant because it's going up and down. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually Vince Lovegrove, who managed them, had seen me there at the front every night. And he said, oh, can we have a look at the photos? Yeah. And I ignored him because I suppose semi-embarrassment. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then he finally, he sort of pestered and said, mm. show me, and I showed mm. him the proof sheets. And he bought a photo and it became the tour post. And I think he gave me 20 bucks and a bottle of vodka. And I was unbelievably happy. Yeah. And he told wow. me, oh, you, your name's on the door. And I was so <laughs> I was so green and naive. Yeah. I just thought, oh, brilliant. Yeah. My name's on the Thinking they got some rehearsal space. <laughs> and they just scribbled Tony Mott's name on the door. Yeah. And then he called me, paying to come in because your name's on the door. And I went, yeah, I know. <laughs> so is this a creative trick just fucking do it and just get in there and like yeah, yeah, no, just do it and Can of course I... as a consequence of that when the poster came out and it was their tour poster and in those yeah. days bands just perpetually played yeah right. it was just perpetual well, they the, played six nights a week in uh, sydney the Divinals i was reading were, yeah. in her Divinals Divinals were do, doing 250 300 gigs a year at that point for those that are less familiar i mean chrissy is, are, is de probably one of the if not the most uh strongest female front rock performer i think i grew Maybe up in our history she should be a statue i grew up 100%, yeah, yeah. Like, like no doubt I mean, she's, got an alley, she's got an alley yeah, in no, melbourne doesn't she's she? okay no one fuck with but um chrissy no, amplett was an incredible yeah. force and an incredible presence and a couple less songs when, yeah. so, so i practiced my art of rock photography on chrissy amplett which is <laughs> what i didn't know at the time was i was practicing on the greatest female performer I've ever come across. I've shot Beyonce, yes, right. Madonna, Diana. And performer. Uh, yeah. perform. I'm, I'm not right. talking about that. I'm not talking about their um, their records. That's more yeah. judgmental. You either like their music or you don't. I'm talking as a performer. Yeah. She was completely unpredictable. Yeah. So you had no idea what was going on. I, I don't want to be negative about someone, but the first time I saw Taylor Swift, 
Mm. Um, the manager said, and he more or less choreographed exactly what would happen in the show, and it did. Mm. And it was like, oh wow, that's it. It's like I see with Chrissy Amplett, you couldn't say, mm. well, in the second song she's gonna. You had no idea she'd yeah. go off yeah. on, and she was a screaming banshee. Mm. Um, she would uh, again uh, what I said previously about there's no pits. Yeah. So you were wedged up against the stage. Yeah. And a lot of the girls used to like to put their handbag on the stage because they, you know, they were rocking away. And Chrissy used to pick up, get the tampons out, get the diary out. And then as the girls lean out, she'd just go, she'd beckon them, beckon them. Do you want to come on my, I don't think you're coming on my stage. She used to put it on the drum riser and just go through it in between songs. And <laughs> the, the, the whole bit. Now she wasn't That's always statistic. like that though, That's was awesome. she? So did you start shooting her before she no, developed no. that stage presence? No, by the time I started, I saw her perform maybe a couple of times and she was very much, she always had the fringe yeah. and I since found she out the power she, she didn't want eye contact because she felt mm. the lyrics. And if you go, if you study Diviner's lyrics, they are quite, uh, they're hers yeah. and yeah. it's about her. Yeah. So she used yeah. to stand there and with the fringe, she got no eye yeah. contact. And then the band started complaining that there wasn't a lot happening on stage. Mm. And she went to the other extreme. She went mm. from that to mm. just this, what, what it was. And then she was a screaming wild woman. You often yeah. had, you feared for her safety, uh, for my safety, everybody's safety. She had no, oh, th th there wasn't a whole lot of barriers or boundaries for her, but come compelling performer with a quite distinctive voice uh, and but at the same time her and Mark the, the dynamic of that band was they were lovers on and off mm -hmm. so there was that diamond mm -hmm. they wrote music together mm -hmm. so there was always there was a lot of conflict and mm -hmm. conflict's fantastic for a musical thing mm -hmm. that that's, yeah. a, that's all great for yeah. that yeah. Uh, and at some point after that album Desperate came out in America they signed to Chrysalis directly yeah. there was a point when they went and they played New York and they were on the cover of New York Times mm -hmm. and the journalist described them this is going to be the biggest band in the world mm -hmm. they make uh, they, they were on the crest of a wave mm -hmm. Freddie DeMann who managed mm -hmm. Madonna at the time got wind of this saw them mm -hmm. absolutely <laughs> thought agreed this is going to mm -hmm. be the biggest band mm -hmm. he quit after six months because he couldn't cope with Chrissy yeah. now this is a yeah. guy who's managing oh. Madonna at the height of her fame yeah. and he found Chrissy difficult that's the yeah. sign of what she is yeah. she was probably her own worst enemy but it's always a contradiction of things is if you'd milded her off even remotely you wouldn't have got that amazing performance yeah. but at the same that's time right. she, <clears throat> she killed her own career in, in lots of ways um, yeah. she, she, she fisted uh, Rennie Gare in the face uh, mm. uh, 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 Frenchers Frenchers not Frenchers what was that bar called Benny's yeah. in King's Cross. Everybody went to Benny's at the yeah. end of the day, yeah. uh, um, and she was there one night with uh, uh, with yeah. And she, um, a fr uh, my wife's uh, friend Lisa Hensley uh, mm. got decked mm. in a toilet, and she, all she did was go up to Chris and go, "I just think you're great." Yeah, Out. right. Why was she, she so mad? Um, she, she definitely had uh, insecurity, and she always said to me, oh, "You got to get on top of someone before they get on top of you." So there's, there's that. Mm -hmm. They were very finicky. That Desperate album, the American version of it, if you look on the back, the credits, there's like 16 producers on it. Mm. They sacked people. And we're talking mm. Bob wow. Clear Mountain, Mike Chapman, oh, wow. yeah. really yeah. high level things. Yeah. So they were very, very, very picky and very definite what they wanted. So, but that's what made them yeah. the fantastic band they were. Do you think she dealt with that shit? Being a woman, like in that kind of pretty aggressively, like you'd have to kind oh, of be a bit tell, more aggressive. She used to tell really funny stories yeah. about that. Uh, yeah. yeah, when they went to America and the guys were having a good time, yeah. uh, and she she was like, I, I'd get these crazy people. She she attracted crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and she remembers this massive lesbian come backstage and put firecrackers around her breasts and set fire to them, and she sat there going, and I'm supposed to what? <laughs> Because the guys are going off with these beautiful women, and I'm, I'm getting it's kind of shit. It's kind of shit, isn't it? It's like female comics. Yeah. Saying, yeah, they get the same yeah. thing. So she's going, yeah. Yeah, what's, that, what's that about? Um, <clears throat> when she wrote a biography, um, uh, and she was obviously uh, quite ill by then, mm. she, uh, yeah. there was a sort of more calmer, uh, calmer person and probably more reflective and stuff. Um, and it's funny, at some point in that, in that, she was at my house for dinner. And at some point she goes, oh, isn't it great that we've remained such great friends and we're really great. And I was thinking, oh, so we're friends. And I was thinking, even though I, I, love, I loved her very dearly and she mm. was great, mm. she never stopped intimidating me. I was always I remember always being like, 11, yeah. 11 yeah. watching uh, whatever the music program was at the time and being... She's great. And being just that little bit much... I was like shit scared and a little bit like, oh, 
This is yeah. what this is this yeah, female right. energy is but, like nothing. But it's, it's this crazy Austra Australian woman. It's Australian Aust woman intensity. Aust We're Austra fucking crazy. Australia had never produced a female yeah. performer like her. Yeah. Yeah. And you've also well, got to remember the world, for a sidebar of all that, yeah. she played Judy Garland mm. on Broadway and got a Tony nomination. That's right. Yeah. Recently. I read that. No, no, no. Uh, well, yeah, well, obviously, obviously in the recently. Early two thousands, wasn't it? Oh, I can't remember Boy from Oz when it was a stage play. She played Judy Garland. That's right. So yeah, she was pretty and when she did the theatre thing or the production of it. She only missed one performance the whole time, so she did have discipline as well. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but she but said she, she learnt a lot yeah, doing those. She, she was, as I said, I've never seen a performer like. I I, I spoke to Chrissy Hind, who said um, yeah, she would never be on a bill with her because there was no point. She'd be blown really? off stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, because if you see the Pretenders, Chrissy Hind again, I don't want to emphasize Chrissy Ampler, uh, Chrissy Hind, Deborah Harry, a great. They're not even in the same league as really? uh, as Chrissy as a performer. As a yeah, uh, just right. as a performer. Yeah. I'm saying, and just as a so performer. She's good stagecraft. If you're a, if you're a musician, you should go and watch some Chrissy Amphlett. You should go watch some oh, Divine. It's just stage. Yeah. It's just, yeah, yeah. She, uh, the main difference between about Chrissy Amphlett was you'd never seen anything like it. It's not unsimilar yeah. to Angus and ACDC. Yeah. For yeah. all those hard yeah. rock bands, rock bands, and the, you could, I'm, I'm not going to get technical about who's good and who's not at guitar. But no one's like Angus. No, I, I was coming He's home. He's just yeah. unique. I, I was watching Let There Be Rock, I think, it was in, in Paris, 1978. And it just came on. I was on a plane flying back from New Zealand. And I've seen hundreds of ACDC videos, hundreds of live. And this one in particular was Bon Scott. And Angus came out and I was just like, holy Fuck. Like it's, he, it's unique. there is yeah. just it's, some, it's, nothing. There is uh, no one and, else and out take, there like Take that. away the guitar playing. Yeah, that's performance. Yeah, he's just, just a performer. He's a great performer. Energy. And he's, yeah. he's still bringing it now. Yeah. Is there something about the digital and film here? Like back then, there was you only got ten percent. There was only like these tiny little, um, these moments, and now everyone can do it, and you get everything, but it's not quite the same. You're not getting these well, like, obviously, yeah, well, transformative uh, moments. Like who are the transformative? Well, I do feel yeah. sorry for today's photographers in yeah. so much as so I'm going out and I'm shooting Johnny Rotten with the Halo shots, mm -hmm. and I think I may have got the shot. It's yeah. in the camera, yeah. and then you know I might have a couple of drinks, and then I go home and I process the film, and that's mm -hmm. in chemicals, mm -hmm. and then I hang it to dry, so I can now see it on an moment. I don't think, oh, that's looking good, but I'm still mm -hmm. not 100%. Uh, and then you put it in an enlarger and there's a plain white piece of paper with smelly chemicals and you put it in and in that moment when it comes up it's like fuck brilliant brilliant i should also pat there's loads of that's way more fun and there's, oh, but there's also the moments or in fact 90 percent of the moments oh. where you go ah oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, i really thought oh. this is the essence of creative life isn't it so, really? so yeah it's like so most of the time you're hard broken but to receive that high yeah. you've got to have about yeah. nine lows yeah. but that 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 is the, but that is still and then of course you're in a dark room so you haven't got a hundred percent but you yeah. more, and yeah. then you hang it up and dry and it's just hanging there and you go wow that's fantastic mm. and that's a that's probably a 24-hour process from when you actually took it whereas now you right. look back at camera i didn't work for yeah. i mean yeah. obviously now people use a camera as a light meter yeah whereas yeah. in my, yeah. my day i mean uh, what what's really weird was it's good to learn on film because you get really good at what you do. That's what I was. I can't even remember what gig it was. There's a girl from the Sydney Morning Herald, some concert, mm. and uh, a camera uh, jammed. And I, 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 she said, "Oh, but you, oh, shoot it manual." I said, "Well, why mm. don't you shoot it manual?" She goes, "How do you do that?" I went, "Well, you work." At, it's like, I said, "Well, you know, you've got a thing at the back of the camera." But she had no idea. She was totally reliant on that camera yeah. getting the light right. Yeah. Whereas I look at a thing, instantly go, oh, right. And I know it's 250th. Yeah. How do you learn light? Trial and error. Just yeah. doing yeah. it and you go, yeah. you, you just so go manual. Just, just you, go you just, manual. Uh, yeah. You always go manual anyway. Yeah. I, I don't know. When they do it, I just can't even comprehend how you start that. You go manual on the whole bit. I get the autofocus, but at the same time, I don't autofocus. I, I manually focus yeah. as well. Yeah. I get the autofocus and the advantage of it. And that's great, but it really, I really emphasise when you're starting, it would be good to learn how to do it. When you get a good photo on film, it's because you did it, not the camera. Yeah. Rejay Harvey, yeah. what did she smell like? Just nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Polly. <laughs> Polly Jane Harvey. Can you, tell, can you tell me everything you have? She's the only rock musician I've ever met that I was too starstruck to say anything. Uh, She's just, yeah. Well, she's very yeah. pleasant. Yeah. Uh, mm. She's pretty easy to get on with. Yeah. Um, I've done quite a few of her. Do you know she's yeah. got curly hair? Yes. Really tight curly hair. Like psycho curly hair. So, yeah. uh, and she strains right. it every day. Anyway, um, big day out. We're in New Zealand and I had a With the brown outfit? You know, the brown... She had yeah, the brown yeah, outfit, yeah. but I, uh, when I was taking the shot, what was she wearing? Uh, I should know because I remember the photo. Cause she, no, she was wearing some... Oh, I did have an she, she was off stage. Yeah. Mm. And we're taking some photos and I said, 
it's for a front cover and she goes oh, i haven't done my hair today and i was like and she didn't want to i said well let's do it and if you don't like them we we're on a plane to Gold Coast, and we could do it tomorrow, but I don't know. Anyway, we, we went round the back of the uh, Gold, uh, the uh, big day backstage, mm. and there's sort of like this area, and this ambulance was coming. So PJ's there, and she sort of she's a really great poser. Yeah. She knows what looks good, I bet, and she's posing. Which of them? And this ambulance driver is so is like, and he goes straight into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and she was saying, oh, that, the ambulance. punchline to me is, yeah. she, she kept saying. Oh, do you think I look any good? Do you think I look good? And when he went out, I said, oh, I'm thinking you're looking for me. <laughs> so, okay, I've got a serious mm -hmm. question. Um, now, there's a scourge in modern rock photography. It's it's four boring guys staring into the distance, wearing leather jackets on a brick wall. Um, I don't want to see it again. I would, I would like it to be stopped. I'd like you to stop it. How can we stop it? Let's burn it to the ground. I hate it. Looks like no one's ever gotten laid. No one's ever gotten laid to that song. Unless it's the remote. No one's ever, it, 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 yeah, the I hate, it makes me really mad. Yeah, but I'm all, sorry. All photos. It's not about sex, but I mean, it's, it's all just fun and photos energy, come and, energy and joy. And, yeah. A lot of people complain that I use the fisheye lens way too much. I got a fish I like your fisheyes. Oh, I loved them. Well, yeah. I loved them. I was infatuated with it. It yeah. was embedded on the front of the camera for a long time. But the reason I got it, I, got, I hired it once. And the reality is bands can be hung over don't really want to do photos, but you need a result. And when it was really boring, you put yeah. fisheye lens on and it sort of warped everything. And it's yeah. like, you got the photo. Is that Rage Against the Machine that, photo? That, yeah, that, well, Rage Against the Machine, yeah. they genuinely said to me, we don't want the fisheye. And I did more or less the whole shoot without a fisheye. Yeah. And we're in this alleyway in Mel... The, the funny thing about the Rage Against the Machine shoot was that was a week of me negotiating with the management, really finicky about mm. what they wanted and what they didn't want. And when I got the brief, yeah. Fish Island under no circumstances. Um, Silver Chair uh, banned it for a while. Yeah. Not the band, the management. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny yeah. story about that actually <laughs> as well. But anyway, so, but then when I met them in the lobby on the day of the shoot, Rage turned up and we'd, we'd been on the road for a while. Yeah. And they went, so what do you want to do? I was like, oh, you've given me the brief exactly what I can. And they went, ah, do whatever you want. So yeah. the band were fine anyway. We went yeah. up and we did Generally the elevator. And eventually I said, oh, your management said they don't want fish eye. And they sort of said, why? And I went, oh, I'm sort of fairly well known for fish eye. And they think it's probably a bit cliche. And they said, well, yeah, if you want to. And I tried it. Hmm. And that shot that got oh, famous yeah. was, was basically the band chose it after the management had said, "Don't, don't do it." And um, the silver chair fish eye was John Watson, who managed him, lovely guy. Mm. Said under no in circumstances fish eye. He swore. And, and, and I went up to um, he didn't, I did. Yeah. And we went up to Newcastle. <laughs> I spent a couple of days with him yeah. in Newcastle. Yeah. And I, at some point, I'd said to the band, "John's banned the fish eye," and they just saw that. And we were doing an approval thing. Mm. Anyway, mm. right at the end, we did all these fish eye shots. Mm. And then I had to ring John. Oh, um, I was staying overnight there, and I sent the one fish eye, and I said, this is the only one the band's approved. <laughs> it was a really, really, really fish eye shot, and yeah. it was just a joke. But I love it, though. It's great. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, I loved it. I, the Beast of Bourbon one in the gun room yeah. for the yep. album cover is a fish eye shot. Yep. Uh, but I did get, I, I, I was very aware that I got in fact it. The worst thing that ever happened was um, this young, and I can't remember the name, unfortunately, but there's this really good um, photographer in Melbourne did a fish eye shot a jet yeah. that got on the front of the that. Melbourne Age yeah. mm. and they sorry. gave me a photo credit because it was fish eye. Yeah, and jet garbage. I'm sorry I'm saying it. I don't know. I'm to me, sorry. to <laughs> me, the fish eye, I remember it was a magazine called, I think it was Juice. Yeah. Australian, there's like the Australian sort of Rolling Stone. Oh, yeah, 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 for yeah. the 90s, very yeah. 90s. And that to me yeah. is, um, and it must have been your new shooting, Silver Chair. I, I would have and done shooting yeah. I guarantee now that if I go into that book and I've got my favourite. He's got an exciting new book. I've got yes. well, I haven't. It's yeah. a, a prototype. It will, but, uh, yeah. There's magazine covers. Coming I did 900 yeah. music magazine covers in that period of time, and and Just I think casually. I, I think I, amazing, I, I think right? I put in my favourite 20, and I guarantee if we look, half of them will be fish eyes. See, I, that's, but that's that's awesome. And I don't know. I love it. Yeah, I didn't count. Yeah, oh, look, we'll have a look. I'm gonna have to shoot over your shoulder later. And what? Um, oh, the Bjork one. What did you say to Bjork before she made that? Oh, I, uh, the, the Bjork one. I said yeah. to her, I wanted to uh, capture eccentricity on stage. And then she said, what eccentricity? I said, all that. And she went, I never do that. I went, oh, I do quite a lot. And then I never really worked out whether she actually was just being funny with me or she was unaware. I've right. met Bjork's mother. Yeah. And she, in fact, is normal. As in Bjork's normal. Yeah. It's yeah. her mother who's the mad as a cat's name. Oh, really? Everything she does is normal. How but I've been to Rachel and yeah. they're all effing mad. Yeah. And so that's yeah. just their culture. How yeah. did you meet her mum? Uh, she was backstage at Glastonbury. Yeah. Hey, is there, a, is there an international uh, community of uh, yeah. photography 
music, photography, yeah. concert guys, you know, Mick Wall, Ross Harfin, guys no, that... No, not at all. You go, do, yeah. do you meet each other in yeah, a bar yeah, yeah, and you, chat? You, yeah, no, mm. you do, not in bars, but you do meet each other. Uh, I've met Ross Harfin... Uh, oh, he's great. ...quite a few times. I mean, Ross Harfin, from that point of view, is very close to being number one in that genre yeah, of music, yeah. that, that, that yeah, hard rock stuff. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And he's been around since the year dot, so it's so he ruled for quite a while. Mm, and mm. I'm quite pleased with him because he was never the number one music photographer in yeah, England, yeah. but he was the number one metal photographer. And then when metal became big, mm. and there was a long period of time where the only photographer shooting Metallica was him, and he yeah, made right. an, an absolute yeah. fortune out of it. Mm. Uh, Good on him. Uh, mm. My story of Ross Alpin was he came out for the big day out to shoot Soundgarden for Kerrang or something, yeah. and he had two assistants. And it was I never had an assistant. Yeah. He'd be on ladders doing that. And he'd be there, and these two assistants were like getting cameras, loading up with film, yeah. like handing them up to him. Strangely, it's 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 quite interesting who you like as photographers. Yeah. And who photographers like. My hero is Penny Smith. Okay. Mm -hmm. She did the Clash's London Calling album cover. Got and, it. And the opposite. Of and, and I gather she was quite obnoxious to record companies. She wouldn't. She always used to shoot grainy black and white. Awesome. And without a doubt, Anton Corbin made a living out of her style. I'm sure, yeah. and that's not knocking him in any yeah. way, because he's obviously way more commercial than she ever was. But she was my hero. She did lots of punk. Lo uh, the Clash's album cover is the most famous thing. Um, but she wasn't very, she didn't get on with record companies very well. Um, so I really like her, and I have met her at a party. Uh, Mick Jones from Big Audio Dynamite in Dynamite introduced me. Oh yeah, no, I told her. She was completely unimpressed. Um, uh, and then <laughs> I really like Wendy McDougall in this yeah. country. Yeah. Uh, I think her photos are, I've always thought her style and the way she does things are great. And I mm. know her as a personal friend, so I know her. Mm. It, it's just weird. I really, and this is really weird that I'd say this, mm. I like Linda McCartney's photos. Right. right. Uh, yeah, yeah, because they're really real. Yeah. They're, they're, she's right. not a great photographer, but yeah. she's real. And I yeah. really like her style. Her book of her stuff, before she's married to Paul, she was shooting lots of bands. Yeah. And I just like her style. Right. Um, Annie Leibovitz to me is the epitome of not a rock and roll photographer. No. <laughs> she's too stylized. I can imagine. Can you imagine I've actually, I actually, I've worked on, yeah. I've worked, yeah. on, I've oh, worked on one of her yeah, shoots. Yeah, exactly. I've worked on one of her yeah. shoots, yeah. and she literally just fires off a couple of shots. Yeah. You set up for like yeah. half a day. She's, she's, so. she's almost like an art director. Yeah. Um, so, but and I'm not, and before we go any further, I don't yeah. want to knock Annie Leibovitz because no. she's obviously a great photographer. I just don't see her as a rock and roll photographer. Whereas no. Lynn Goldsmith, mm. who's probably the grungier version of Annie from New York, right. her stuff is... I mean, she's got the famous one of Keith Richards with No Drugs Allowed at, yeah. at, at, yeah, yeah, yeah. at Customs. Yeah. And it's just a great rock and roll photo. Yeah. Annie would have a team styling it and doing that. And it's, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to star Keith. I want to see, yeah. I want to see yeah. her doing that in the pit at a regular show at a pub, just the um, Annie Lee Roots team. Yeah, just going to do it. And then they're, <laughs> Good luck they're, they're, with that. It's the encore, <laughs> and then she comes up and goes... So, so I, and I've got, I'm trying to think of the guy who was doing grunge and I've forgotten his name, Danny Clinch. Danny yeah. Clinch, I think he's out of LA and I, I've never met him. I just like his style and I always yeah. liked his photos. Yeah. Is um, that unexpected? Is that what makes a great rock photographer? Is that, that like thing you wouldn't expect or like that? What, what are you looking for? Uh, when I'm looking at others, when you're looking at uh, stuff as well. I'm usually quite envious of what, like, like Bledwin Butcher, we were looking at his book yeah. early, Bledwin Butcher. Yeah. I've very rarely seen a Bledwin Butcher where I haven't gone, oh, fuck, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, right. I, I, and I always look at his photos and think he knows the go-betweens, yeah. as in he knows what they're about. He knows yeah. what Nick Cave's about. He's in. The reason that I've been really successful is I'm not actually a very good photographer. I'm I'm good. I'm not a great photographer. There's loads mm. of greats. But what I am good at is, if someone said to you tomorrow, you're doing uh, Slipknot. Mm -hmm. I'd be listening to their music. I yeah. knew exactly yeah. where they're at, really? and I had an empathy to them. And when I take a photo of Slipknot, mm. uh, I would meet Corey probably or the manager or yeah. whatever, yeah. and I must turn up to a meeting with six ideas because I know he's going to yeah, get right. three. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So you come up with three ideas. A lot of photographers who are way superior photographers to I have started in fashion uh, or, or some other <clears throat> genre of yes. photography. Yeah. When you get a model, you're telling her what to do. And she must do it, or he. Yeah. The yeah. model does what you because yeah. that's their job. It's that's their, yeah. So you turn to a model. I remember doing a shoot with Elle McPherson. Yeah. And mm. it was like, fuck, this is easy. You say pathos, she looks like a dad's just right. done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want sex. She looks really sexy that whole bit. Mm. You say that to Chrissy Ampler, she's going to debt you. Yeah. yeah. When you yeah. turn up with Chrissy Ampler to do a photo shoot, you go, these are my ideas. And you, you have half a dozen ideas, and she'll knock three on the head. And the photo is a collaboration. Between yes. you artists. and the artist, yeah. Yeah. and so and yeah. that, it doesn't matter who the band is. You talk to Metallica in advance. You say, "This is what I'm thinking of doing," and they will come out with, 
Oh, yeah. I, in fact, they did this to me. I said, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. I thought, massive lens down the lens of the backstage corridor. Mm. It's really long with massive lens. And they literally turned and said, yeah, Ross did that a couple of weeks ago. So you, did you shoot, you shot Motorhead in a toilet? Is I that did, yeah. That's a way better story than uh, me uh, getting uh, it. Uh, no, no. It's, uh, at the urinals, just the four of them lined up against the urinals. Of course you did, yeah. Over the shoulder. <laughs> Perfect. Over the, yeah, Lemmy. they're all looking over the shoulder. Because you've both, but, you've but, both, you've interviewed Lemmy and you've shot Lemmy. Well, so my, I'm my so Motorhead jealous. story before the urinal shot was, uh, I met them at the, you nearly always meet bands at sound checks. That's a good place to yep. get them. Yeah. You've yeah. trapped them. So we, we were at the Horden Pavilion. It is without a doubt the loudest sound check I've ever been to. And the glass. You're the, the second person to say that. Yeah, yeah, Someone I, else I, I, that. 10, I yeah. lost 10% of my hearing. Oh, I've heard a one. The loudest sound check I've ever heard. Yeah. They were either off their faces or drunk as skunks. They came yeah. over from Japan. Yeah. And we're, doing, we're, doing, we're doing a shoot, and uh, it was all working out very easily a little bit. Yeah. And at some point, um, I think it was Animal, turned to me and said, yeah. uh, Do you like living here? And I said, Yeah, it's great. And he said, he said Oh. He said, There's a lot of Caucasians, isn't there? And I went, yeah. And he said, and he thought he was still in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> They've been there for 24 hours and he was yeah, right. he's, he's going, yeah. this is the Budokan, isn't it? I went, no, it's Horton Ville in Sydney. He goes, no, we're there next week. I went, no, you're here now. <laughs> oh. And none of the other band members turned around and went, they all just went, oh, right. oh, okay. right, no. that, that was their first day here. They, they had flown in that yeah. morning. He had a good remember. run, Lemmy. He did have of a good hard living. Of hard, hard living. I, I think it'd be fair I reckon to say, the 50 year... I think, it'd be, yeah. I think it'd be fair to say Lemmy is... Lemmy with Keith are the two rock and rollers who've lived the life fully, as in, without a break, they just do that lifestyle the whole bit. And I think some yeah. medical science magazine put out that Lemmy was possibly the longest, um, uh, like, isomethamphetamine per like taker choice. in the world. Does 50 it? years, they reckon. One of his proudest boasts was, uh, oh, no, it wasn't. Oh, yeah, it was the proudest boast. Uh, it was the young ones. I yeah. just thought it was great that he'd been yeah. on the young ones. He yeah. just couldn't believe well, The funny thing is, that's where I first saw him. That was the very first time I saw Lemmy. And I developed an embarrassment over the years as I got more and more into, you know, music. And and, uh, and I was so embarrassed to tell... I never told anyone that the first time I ever saw Lemmy or knew of Motorhead was watching the young ones when I must have been about well, nine. He was, just and more, then, he was just more chuffed that he couldn't believe someone mainstream writing would want Motorhead. Yeah. And he just Aww. thought it was brilliant. He just yeah. thought it was great. He was forever grateful. And he, funny what you said, but it got them to a, a new audience. Well, that's what in America. Like Dave Grohl was saying the same yeah, thing. So it was like yeah. a new He ended yeah. our interview by saying, I'm singing Just For You Covered In Sequins, which uh, stays with me to this day. It keeps me warm at night. Thank you ever so much, Australia, for being so welcoming and gorgeous <laughs> and, uh, and singing Just For You Covered In Sequins. It is actually on yeah. in, in uh, music history is embedded and close to unique. Yeah, That's right. It really is. No yeah. one quite liked Motorhead. No. They, they were unique. And strangely, everything about Motorhead is attitude. Mm -hmm. 100%. Commitment and attitude, isn't it? It's just the attitude. <laughs> yeah. of what's but it's so yeah. direct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's committed. Yeah. It's unlimited. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, not, and will not change under no. any circumstances. What's the Motorhead way? How would you describe it? Um, dogged persistence in the face of mounting evidence to the contrary. Yeah. <laughs> Never apologised, yeah. just did It's hard to thing. believe he was in Hawkwind. Yeah. I know, right? That's, crazy. that's no, no. hard to believe. Isn't yeah. it incredible? Being Jimmy There's some road. funny stories that, about that. That, that, um, that uh, Castle Donington I was talking about, uh, with Euro Heat, Hawkwind was, the other, was one of the others. Ah, oh, they were, yeah, right. Oh. Far right, because they've had a few different lineup changes. I mean, oh, they, uh, yeah, they've had hundreds, yeah, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's his Absolutely. name? Block? Dave Block? Yeah, and there's a Nick, name? there's a Nick and the Dave, yeah. And then let me kill me stuff. Yeah. He, got, he got kicked out in Canada, didn't he? He, got, he, was out, he bought a f camera and he was out taking photos and some guy knocked him over the head and took his camera. And at the time, the band got on the bus and took off to Canada. He was in America, that's right. Yeah. And when he went through the border, he got done for drugs. Yeah, right. And that was, that was it. They kicked him out of, uh, of Hawkwind. And they already had the Motorhead song, so he took the Motorhead song and made it Motorhead. And the rest is history. So it's what it's what it's not what happens to you; it's what you do with it. Yeah. That's right. And maybe that is yeah. our uh, dear old Lemmy. Should this hey. be our? Are we? Are we on? Are we'll we, finish we, on I that. Think, I think yeah. we're pretty deep, and I think we can't go higher or lower. We can't get higher than. Who Lemmy. did we start with? Yeah. Chrissy. Yeah. And we ended on Lemmy. And we didn't yeah. even touch on your stones, yeah. Rolling Stones. Um, but yeah, it's been thank amazing, you. Tony. The voice. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Fifty-eight dead people in here. 58. That seems like a lot.
It is a lot, isn't it? Well, I don't know. It's frightening. How many decades? Well, 81, so that's what, 90, yeah, it's 40 years. Mm. Johnny Rotten, Johnny Lydon, Horton Pavilion with the Halo shot. Yeah. Um, he bought it for his biography. Michael Hutchins, uh, that ended up on the cover of Rolling Stone. My first ever international shoot, Eurythmics. That's, um, yeah. Beast of Bourbon in the gunnery. Chrissy Ampler never forgave me for dressing her in a white slip. As she put it, she was a black slip sort of girl. <laughs> That's incredible. Which one, BB? Yeah. BB King. Moment. Nick Cave, that's in his flat in Kensington. Beastie Boys, Bjork with the ex trying to capture the her eccentric. See, see, if that was anybody else, it doesn't yeah. work. But for yeah. Bjork, it's yeah. it's Bjork. That's, that's who great. she is. He's way too good looking. That's yeah. it's good look. <laughs> silly. He's still kind of terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Marilyn, that's like I say. How can you not get a great? You know, the image yeah. is just in front of you. Tex on stage with the Tex grin. Yeah. The Glimmer Twins. Who is your favourite? Um, well, oh, God, that's difficult. Um, they're just, they're the stones. <laughs> Henry. What's weird about that one is Henry at the Paddington RSL Club. That sort of doesn't compute. Uh, mm. Iggy. Oh, we didn't even talk about Iggy. No, we didn't. Can we talk briefly about Iggy? Can we take a one, can you give me a... He's 68 when I took that photo. And he was by far the most energetic performer on the bill. He's Iggy, just being Iggy. ACDC, not going to a lot of trouble for the first session. <laughs> Great juxtaposition there. Alice, smoking a nail. Nick and Carly, what which is, that? which is, which is, that's on the big day out. It's backstage of the big day out. What's really weird about that is when that first was announced, they did a, I, I was thinking, PJ Harvey, Nick Cave? Yeah, I can see that. Kylie Minogue, Nick Cave? But it worked. Concrete Blonde at Banjo Patterson's Grave. Johnny Cash. Cash. When will this uh, tome be in the, the world? Oh, sometime next year, I'd imagine. So this is a special sneak peek. It is, yeah. I've got to work out what's good and bad about it. Um, 33 in Rooftop, New York. Chrissy, that's probably a quite a famous, you know. Yeah. That's, you know. that's the one. I think that's the one everyone yeah. thinks of. Isn't yeah. It? Wow, baby Dave there. Fleetwood Mac. What were they like? Touring with the insane is not easy. Uh -huh. Marion Faithful, another intimidating female. Yeah. Good oh, fish eye shot. Yeah, that's solid work. PJ Harvey. Oh, that one of um, Aussie. Yeah. Hey. Chili Peppers, Queens of Stone Age. That's a great position. That's wrong. Joey Ramone in daylight. That yeah. shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. I need to get this and Dave Grohl. Oh. Ramstein. Yeah, too. This is um, before they were big and they were staying in the same hotel as me in London. And I took it, that's in Hyde Park, London. I just took them across the road, took photos. Um, sure. That's it, really. When we all get back into this shit, and honestly, I think it's going to be the scientists and the vaccine that's going to do it, things are going to be mental. I think everyone's going to be fucking grinding all over each other. I want to dance like Salma Hayek and. Like, what's that fucking dust till dawn? I actually, side note, I don't want to listen to anything that Salma Hayek couldn't dance to on that stage in From Dust Till Dawn. That is the kind of rock and roll. If, if Salma Hayek could not dance to it, I don't want to listen to it. And that's the reels. And that is all we have to say. And as a closer, everything great about rock and roll is the opposite of Kanye West. And I will say that right now. I think anyone who says slavery is a choice is a piece of garbage who diminishes like great heroes of the civil rights era. He is a disgusting example of people who have to deal with mental illness because he does not deal with his illness and he could have any resources in the world. His wife is a billionaire and I just, his arrogance and just the dripping ego, I just find so unpleasant. I hate, all the greatest musicians are humble, you know? All, all, uh, all my I will hate on Kanye West, do something good. My biggest beef with him was when he came out, it was before Glastonbury, um, oh, it was four or five years ago. And 
we did have a conversation and I did say, I did say I wasn't, yeah, I did say, oh, I'm not going to. I just, I, I, just I just made him go there. I'm not, he, she has, she's yeah. dragged me into it and I'm here now. And all I have to say on Kanye West was he came out and, and basically announced himself as the biggest rock star in the world. Th yeah. Then, then went on stage and Sorry. did, did what was quite possibly one of the worst renditions of Bohemian Rhapsody, laughable rendition. That makes me really sad today. Um, and then that was it. That's all. I just hate the arrogance. It's just I just know so many people who are so talented and so brilliant. And it's like Hendrick. And even from my friends to like bands in our world, right up to the Hendrixes and the Bowies of the world, none of them have ever, because no one truly great behaves like that. And that is just, I don't know. Sometimes I just uh, wear, I mean, my, okay, my who does? No, I was going to say like, you know, you got someone like Madonna. I'm so mad. Right? Sorry, guys. I need to calm down. You got someone like Madonna, who yeah. Madonna is where she is because she has had that single-minded focus that she. But I kind of respect her for that. And that's what I'm saying. I'm presenting a different side to it all. I mean, a lot of rock Don't stars. Don't be president. Are rock stars because yeah. they have that side. You have mentioned a that's bunch of guys that w were, um, without argument geniuses and musical um, um, gods yeah. and we're amazing people i mean i was watching a beatles thing the other day when they came to australia in 65 i think it was no 64 anyway they came to Mel they came to australia and they played all their press uh from all around australia which they did loads and loads of press for and they were just cool charismatic dudes I mean. just... but in order for certain people to get to that position and the, the madonnas of the world i mean you can, you it's a very interesting prince. argument I mean, yeah. prince prince has an ego but, yeah, but he backs that asshole. shit yes, up I, know. I guess he backs that shit up he about. practices it just it's the arrogance without the backup you can do that stride onto the stage be prince be purple be be that but you have to back it up it's just my point is and i think it does need to be said that i just I just feel so passionately about rock music culture and I want it to, and sometimes I find it hard, the embarrassment of riches that is distributed, how the way things are distributed now. And I just, especially at a time like this, when I see stuff that just like is, I just, I'm really worried that rock will survive, you oh, know? Well, and, you know? Everyone needs, it will. It it will because there's no substitute. Oh my god, it's going to be so good. There's no substitute for a really loud fucking guitar. Who, okay, so fantasy. We're we're going back 2021. Rock and roll is back. You can pick anyone to see. I would like to say that I would very much like to see fucking Neurosis. I want to see Neurosis. I want to see maybe Neurosis converge. Get fucking Dillinger back together. Um, just actually, that's a pretty solid lineup. I'll take that as a as a beginning. See, I'm I'm Ramstein. Yeah, really. I, yeah, I can't wait. I saw them in New York and Chicago in 2017, and some of the greatest music on a stage really? as part of the show that I've ever seen. What should we get into and if we're to reassert like? The I, Ramstein, you, I don't like. They're not really talked about much in the current parlance no they are if you but see this I is the thing we all live in these tiny bubbles. that's exactly right you live in these tiny bubbles i mean their, their last album um is is amazing um al slander you know the songs that you could hear at a nightclub and yet the uh pulp, as a poop uh, is p-u-p-p-e i well, when we get to talk about degrees of heaviness yes. i played this for someone the other day till lindemann's vocal in that song and the lyrics because uh, they translated for me, um, were incredible. And, and, you know, it's, and I think that's maybe what's happened with rock lately, rock and, and, and guitar-based music. Yeah. Is it, and maybe this is the internet, and maybe, I mean, it's happened with politics, why wouldn't it happen yeah. with music? That we've all formed these little bubbles and we get a feed of our stuff, but we don't look outside of our little bubbles yeah. too often. So some, like... I mean, Ramstein have been quite present on the world stage 
in those people that are, yeah, that are into Ramstein. Yeah. And believe me, there's there's a shitload of. Um, what is heavy music? I think like one thing that we'd like to get you guys involved in over time, and and that's like the interactive element of the show. We want to have your voices and your videos in this program because I think this has always been about a community. I started making the void because I loved you guys and love you know i've got the best comment section on the internet so i'd love to get we'd love to get your you know you guys to send videos we'll have some details on how to do that but um one a real thread that um we've talked a lot about that is going to be a big part of the show is what is heavy music what are degrees of heaviness and what defines it so i thought we'll kick this off in this particular episode like what that means what do you think it means degrees of heaviness for me um and reminder to check out our Spotify playlist because some of these songs that um, uh, have degrees of heaviness for me. So a degree of heaviness for me, it's like a song doesn't necessarily, I mean, a song doesn't necessarily have to be heavy as in, you know, gent guitars and, and nah. heavy, heavy guitars Sorry. to be heavy. It's not, a, it's not just about the vocal um, it's not just about the production. Sometimes, like I, I mentioned before, uh, uh, Ramstein, you know, Lindemann's vocals uh, and his his song, to his um, subject matters, when you do get it translated, is heavy as shit. Nick Cave in the uh, birthday party, a friend of mine constantly referenced that. He'll come in to work when I'm playing a monomath in my office and he'll be like, that's not heavy music. Heavy music, Nick Cave in the birthday party, you know, 70 eight whenever it was and and he for me uh nine inch nails um the big is it the becoming um you know on downward spiral downward spiral live 94 heavy. didn't have a home fucked up everything's mistakes everything's perfect heavy as shit heavy as shit yeah. um but you know i think there's a song by luden wainwright the third called Motel Blues yeah. and it's basically a folk song and him playing on a guitar about a traveling art a traveling rock uh, a traveling artist yeah. living in motels around America and there's a lyric at the very end that he sings that makes what is effectively a jangly folk song into a heavy as shit song and for me that's super heavy Pavarotti doing Caruso um that is fucking heavy as shit you know these are the degrees of heavy. The fucking reference right there. It's not all about yeah. um, primitive man. Um, I will play that. Have you heard that? It's just, it's like a ball. It's the heaviest shit I've actually ever heard. It is like being, I just felt like cement and gravel and being buried in the earth. So what? Who is that? A this is like a modern band. This right. Thing, this guy who um, actually had on this podcast a few episodes back, but mm -hmm. it's just. It's an assault. It emotionally, like, and it, it's it makes you feel so much sorrow. Like you can't. I almost think it's for me. It's like emotional as well. well like you know, when it starts like getting right in there and yeah. just like I mean, fucking a pain. Like yeah, there are London grammar songs yeah. that are emotionally heavy. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to open up the degrees of heaviness to you guys, and it's not just don't get us wrong it's not just about guitar based heavy metal or any world it we want to know degrees of heaviness that transcend um genre and 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 types of music um it's something that i've been pleasantly obsessed with my whole music listening career um i mean the opening lyrics uh, the opening fucking of iron man black sabbath i mean incredible like that is heavy as shit but that is not all that defines heaviness so degrees of heaviness we want to throw it out to you guys you guys need to email us and, and let us know yep. the boy 333 at gmail i'll put it on the comments and all that kind of garbage mm. i mean like a production like heaviness filters hey man nice shot i think i've mentioned that before put it on our playlist for the f episode one um that chorus in hey man nice shot i mean that is heavy as shit and also the lyrics you know it's about a, a real life event um so those lyrics are, are heavy as shit what's the story um it was a oh politician i think it was italian politician i might yeah. no, italian politician or he was doing a live press conference pulled out a gun and shot himself on 
live TV. That's fucking dark. It, well, you, I wasn't going to tell the story for exactly that reason. But um, He's sad. But the, the lyrics of the song is all about, hey, man, nice shot, sounds like. But it's, 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 it's again, heavy as shit. That's, that's, it doesn't all have to be heavy like that. But heavy, I mean, heavy is what I fell in love with with music and why I've spent so much of my life, like, making music content and interviewing musicians and um, ruining my career in the mainstream media by talking about heavy music because it's absolutely ignored and hated in this country. Oh, my God. To say heavy music in this country in the radio and television industry is a pariah is just the understatement of the world. It is amazing. It's like you walk in and you're like a Scientologist. If you want to say, hey, maybe like this is a community and it exists and maybe and they're like, oh, it's a bit too fucking heavy. And you're like... Maybe what you just put on is a bit too soft. That's a whole other story that I'll get into at another time. So yesterday uh, was Chris Cornell's 56th birthday. And to celebrate the anniversary, we were talking about Guns N' Roses earlier, uh, Chris Cornell's estate has released uh, his cover version of the f classic Guns N' Roses Patience. Um, wow. It's a little bit more ambient, but it's pretty much, if you imagine what Chris Cornell would do to patients, it's pretty well exactly what he's done. I mean, I think Chris Cornell is um, the voice the voice of, of a generation without being too cheesy about it. I really think he was the greatest singing talent we had. Um, he like touches you on the inside of your heart, mm -hmm. like and all your sads and like all, there's some sort of like, it's like his voice vibrates on something that does go beneath skin and burn through everything and just yeah like f fell on you know, fell on black days i mean it's just you can't i don't think there's a more beautiful song about a sadness mm. like, and, you know, you can't and kim never gets enough fucking attention or respect for being that guitar oh. player. yeah yeah never gets enough respect he, never gets he, enough he, he, he is, really doesn't like he's massively yeah. underrated as yeah. a guitarist of of particularly the early 90s it, yeah. or most of the 90s but and i think Unfortunately, maybe Kim Kim was never eclipsed by Chris himself, but Chris's voice and frontman capabilities did maybe, yeah. unfortunately, maybe eclipse. I mean, Ben Shepard um, and Matt Cameron yeah. uh, as a backline are amazing. I mean, I think Matt Cameron was playing with Pearl Jam for a long time. Um, but Kim, Matt and Ben... I mean, Chris Cornell would probably be horrified to think that that was the case, yeah. but he was such a bright light and such and a really fucking and a dark light. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it's such an incredible voice yeah. that um, I don't know. But Kim, yeah, Kim's Kim's playing um, incredible. I feel like there is like a line. This sounds really weird, but a line between Anthony Bourdain and Chris Cornell, and we lost them. And I, I'm not, I can't remember if it was the same year, but in the last few years, and I feel like they both completely changed the game for what they did and brought a lot of soul and a lot of really unique words and perspective and presence. Mm. Um, that sounds really weird. I seem to compare everything to Anthony Bourdain, but well, um, lost, I yeah. mean, um, also, unfortunately, Chris's Chris Cornell's birthday is also. The anniversary of Chester Bennington's uh, death, uh, July twentieth, twenty seventeen, and um, I know that they were apparently they were very close. Yeah. And um, Chester Bennington had made a reference to he can't imagine living in a world, which is sort of a throwaway line. But yeah. um, Chester was struggling with his his own um, issues, yeah. and um, so unfortunately, yeah, it's uh, it doesn't mark a super happy day, but. Um, no. Uh, you know, I wasn't a huge listener of Lincoln Park, but um, yeah, I've definitely listened to more Soundgarden than Lincoln Park. But yeah. you can't deny that he made that a seismic contribution. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and 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 Chester was was quite was really respected. I mean, he too had an incredible voice, um, and quite rightly is yeah. respected in certain bubbles. Yeah, we're talking about um, big bubbles. Yeah, so yeah, it's a, a pity. It's sad. Um, uh, and but they left, but they left a, a legacy, and like, and you know, we did. had to do it together. And I think some, I mean, I can think of like someone I lost in my life, Alicia, who was, a, who was an amazing musician, but she never recorded any music. She left this world so young that I'm eternally grateful that all these people left something behind because you you would not know the like the sorrow of not having someone get their voice on 
on tape before they die. So yeah. Well, so well, let's keep it on a really light I've kind got, of vibe. I've got a lighter yeah. note. Can we can we lighten it up on the I've way got out another here? Another anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Another anniversary. It's thirty years of Rust in Peace, Megadeth's album, and to celebrate the anniversary, Mustang is releasing. Dave Mustang, Mustang. is releasing. Mustang? I said Mustang. Dave Mustaine is releasing a book on the making of the very successful and well-known and well-loved album, Megadeth album, Rust in Peace. Also being celebrated, it will be the jigsaw puzzle of Rust in Peace that will be released. Dad rock, my friends. Dad yeah, rock. Man. So teach your young child about Megadeth. That's right. Well, I, don't I feel know. like we just got all news mini. I felt like that was a, a cute little news a news item. Well, you wanted to bring it up. We I wanted to we up. wanted to like, you know, yeah, lighten the I mean, mood. Look, Mustang talking about his mark on Metallica. You can't deny Mustang, you know, those early Metallica albums had uh, that big old ginger thread all through that, them. I gotta say, I reckon Dave Mustaine's rise from the ashes, meaning being kicked out of a what was inevitably going to be uh, a massive band, Metallica, he, driven by rage or jealousy or whatever it was, Dave, within a very short period of time, created a band that actually went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Metallica. Um, again, I would fall on the Metallica side to the Megadeth. Yeah. Megadeth's kind yeah. of... Someone I saw someone some someone has wrote, had a write up about um, Megadeth the other day and said, "Why does Dave Mustaine always sound like an angry teenager?" And um, made me laugh, but um, because I can see what they mean. Um, so yeah, thirty years, well done, uh, Megadeth and Rust in Peace. Thanks for being with us, boys and girls, and uh, thanks for staying all the way to the end. Uh, you should do it. It's like a marathon. It's you time. should spend some time. Time. You lasted. You lasted the distance. Yeah. I'm going to be inappropriate all the time. It's time for us to say goodbye. I feel like we're in play school. I, know. <laughs> I got. I just got that, but I liked it. I'm going with it. I actually quite enjoyed it. I, I was like, I could see this coming, and I was like, this is going to feel like play school, yeah. but it's, well, you know, Mr. Rogers. Sometimes but you got to embrace I it. Kinda, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I went, fuck it. I'm into yeah. this. It's time it's, for us to this say. This is metal school. It's yeah. like goal school. It's that um, Motorhead and Goal School song. You should go and listen to that, which is called uh, "Please Don't Touch," which was Motorhead's biggest ever song, and is a frick fucking epic video clip. So yeah, we'll be back next week with more exciting things. Next Friday, we'll be putting out a few little moments from various things throughout the week. Um, you can check out a video that I just put up of great pranks that I have uh, filmed with various people from Tony Omi and Ian Gillen to um, uh, Motorhead and Testament. It's pretty fun. So that's like some other stuff on the channel you can check out. Um, yeah, like be excellent to each other. Be excellent. See you guys. Bye. <laughs>